If you are looking for perfect artistic gifts for your loved ones when you travel, then check the elegant handcrafted ceramics at the House of Raw. Use the code TSMOSH and save on your first purchase. Details in the show notes of this episode. Hello and welcome to season three of Travel Stories with Marsh. So if you love the world around you and you love exploring different landscapes, cultures, cuisines and cities, then you are in the right place because here every week I'll be talking to an incredible travel enthusiast who will take us on a journey around the world by sharing their travel stories. My very special guest on today's episode is someone who I can confirm has the most intoxicating energy. Julie Lewis is an adventurer, an explorer, a warrior, and an author who has in fact released her latest book, Uncharted Waters, earlier this year. Julie is the founder of the first female expedition company in the Middle East. And according to her, travel is living and therefore her life, of course, is filled with the most enriching experiences. And she joins us here in the studio today to talk about her amazing travel tales from her very exciting life. Julie, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. And there's so much that I want to talk to you about and I don't know where to begin. (laughs) But, you know, uh, I am taken back to the time when we met for the first time. And uh, there was something very beautiful that you said to me. You said, um, leave a place. And, you know, we were talking about our love for travel and the world at large, uh, our love for the world at large. And you said to me, leave a place better than you saw it. And that stayed with me. And I was like, wow, that is so fascinating. So talk to me about this, this love for exploration that you have. Yes, from being a, a little girl, my father bought me a globe mm. and we used to play spin the globe. You know, I'd, I'd kind of close my eyes, spin it and then put my hand on a spot and then that's where I want to go. And we'd have conversations about that country, what the landscape was, what people ate there, what they wore, etc. Mm. I would have wild dreams that evening, you know, that I was this, you know, Amazonian. I was a dog sledder. I was up on a mountain. I was running through forests. So from a very early age, I had this... Um, Uh, vision of the world and where I wanted to be in the world Mm. and it took some time to make that happen Um, and and then really you know that saying leave a place better than you found it is very much what I call you know it is known as regenerative tourism Mm -hmm. so it could just be um, as we mentioned picking up litter um, planting a tree uh, cleaning up a beach area um, you know supporting a community project so you leave your footprint or your your thumbprint on that place mm. and, and just feel that you've actually done something positively yeah. for the environment as opposed to, you know, not leave a positive footprint, yeah. basically. Yeah. So that concept of, you know, rejuvenating yourself through mm. travel, but regenerating, leave a place better than you found it. That so. is that is amazing. And also, isn't that so important in the world that we live today, you know, where things are kind of disintegrating and, you know, world, it, we are actually facing danger in so many ways. You know, the existing mm. in this world has become... Uh, difficult. I mean, we don't find pure air, we don't find clean water. So all that, like taking care of the place you live in and your surrounding is so important. And that's so beautiful what you said. But you know, you are also known as the queen of resilience. Um, (laughs) You know, there because of because the life that you had, I mean, there's so many uh, things that you have faced in your life from having to flee from Kuwait during the war, from being widowed at a very early age. Um, But amidst all this adversity that was there in your life, you always found that nature and travel healed you. So how is it that you found answers in nature and the world in general or in mountains? Because, you know, you went on to become a mountaineer after that. That's right. I think, you know, when we go through different transitions in our life or life altering circumstances, it really kind of stops us in our track. Mm. So 
I found that uh, climbing my first mountain 22 years ago was really um, a, an epiphany, a life-altering moment that gave me the courage and the confidence to start my expedition company, to offer more experiences mm. for people to use that as a, a resource, mm. um, you know, to say, okay, I feel I need a change, I'm experiencing some challenges, um, what can I do? Mm. And say, Here's, take my hand, let's go and climb a mountain, let's go through the forest, let's, um, you know, ride a boat down a river, just to actually be in nature and connect with wildlife. Mm -hmm. And you see things very, very differently. And it's really kind of fueling your soul and, and to be able to say thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, filling your chest with um, fresh air and, and hearing the sounds of nature and connection, uh, you know, with wildlife. So, so powerful. Yeah. So it's um, saved me, it's healed me, it's transformed me. And I'm so happy to be able to offer those opportunities to others now through the work and yeah. through the books and speaking. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's so fantastic. So you do believe that, you know, everything, the answers are there out there in nature. Definitely. We just need to go and seek them and find them, but they're there. Yeah. And that is so very important in life, you mm. know. So anyway, now coming <laughs> back to the podcast and our travel stories, Tell me, where are you taking us on a journey today? We are going to go way, way, way down south mm -hmm. to the ends of the earth. Okay. To Antarctica. Oh. Getting to Antarctica is a challenge in itself, yes, you know, to go yes. through the dreaded Drake Passage. Yeah, yeah. Um, but then to kind of go into this almost like a portal of stillness and silence and beauty and, you know, so much water, icebergs with all different colors and thousands and thousands of these little penguins that mm. kind of come and say hello mm. yeah. <laughs> you know the whales the seals the albatross so it's it's just a real um eye-opener and it took my breath away the first time I went in 2012 I took a team of women mm. and for all of us you know we were just the, the jaw and mm. and it was just look at this beauty and mm. you can't hear Silent. Wow. And this vastness. And then you just imagine that you're at the bottom of the earth, this tiny, tiny little blip. Mm. Um, and everything else, all your worries and all your cares melt away. Mm. And you just don't want to sleep because mm. you just want to watch everything and see everything and experience everything. And you're in this whole new world where you're saying, wow, 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 wow. You know, it's um, like a sensory overload mm. because you're mm. seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, touching so many different things mm. that your brain becomes neurally alive mm. instead of this autopilot, you know. Yeah. So yeah. it's, um, that was a very, very big life altering trip for me. And I know it's not, um, it's not one of the easiest places to get to, yeah. but I feel if you can get there mm. in your lifetime, it, it truly is heaven on earth. Heaven yeah. on earth. Yeah. Yes. And you just said something so interesting that you don't want to sleep when you are there. <laughs> Tell me why, you know, was it so life altering for you? I mean, um, uh, apart from the, the beauty that surrounded you, the nature that surrounded you. Yes. What else really captured your mind in such a beautiful way about Antarctica? I think it was just that vastness mm -hmm. of open spaces and, and, and not, uh, not so much interference with buildings. I mean, a few research stations, etc. Mm -hmm. But just to see how life uh, thrives there in such a harsh, mm -hmm. um, unpredictable environment. Mm -hmm. And we were on a small expedition ship with around 108 passengers. And I'd taken a team of women and a videographer because I thought this is something that you need to capture. Mm -hmm and have an experience that is so different. And when you're away for a, a period of time, we were on the ship for 10 days, mm. you start to flow in tune with nature. You know, you're not so hurried. You're mm. just very much present and being and the slightest sound or the slightest movement in the water. You know, you th is it a whale? Is it, you mm. know, is it an albatross that's popped up? Or mm. So it just helps you become so much more present and mm. aware mm. of yourself, of others, and the wildlife, but also of nature that we're not apart from it, we're a part of it, we're yeah. this ecosystem. Yeah. And to be able to experience that. So would you say that, you know, go to Antarctica only when you're ready to absorb nature in its entirety? It will call you, yeah. you know. It's, some people say, I, that is I, very couldn't, true. I wouldn't, that is I, wouldn't very I don't true. want to yeah. go to a cold place. I don't want to yeah. go across the, you know, the sea because yeah. I heard that it's very, you know, rough crossing there and everything. There is a calling. Yeah. Um, and, um, but you just know, mm. you know, sometimes you need to go so, so, so far away. Yeah. So it all depends what's happening in yeah. our life. That's so exciting. I'm like, I have been thinking of this Antarctica trip for a while now. Yes. And, like, and when you said it will call you. Yes. I was like, oh my God, you're so right. Because 
you know, I, I feel that now. I feel like I want to go there and I, I don't like cold places. <laughs> you know, so for me to be yes. to be at a point when I'm saying that, you know, I want to go to, it's huge. Mm. You know, I, I went, I've been all the way to Buenos Aires, but I haven't been to Antarctica. And now I feel I want to do that just because I want to experience nature in mm. its its entirety and yeah. just be purest. one with nature and yeah. its purest form and all of that. Okay, I mean, yeah, Antarctica sounds very exciting, but now let's talk a little bit about your book, Uncharted yes. Waters. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, you've recently released it earlier this year, and um, you talk about water and you say how, you know, water can solve so many of our problems, but at the same time, it is an element that needs so much attention in today's world. So tell me a little bit more about why you feel the way that you do about water. We can't live without water. Mm. No water, no life. Mm. It gives life to everything, mm. but it can also destroy life. You know, right. we've seen storms, yeah. etc. Yeah. And I think we often take water for granted. We just think that we'll mm. always turn the tap on and we have clean water. Mm. Um, it's the same with air. We always mm. think, you know, we don't think about having to breathe. We just breathe. Yeah. And I attempted to swim the English Channel in 2018. Mm -hmm. Didn't quite make it to France, but that's when I really felt the importance of water and, and taking care of water so it can take care of us. Mm -hmm. So we know that, you know, the ocean is full of things that it shouldn't be full of, that it's impacting the marine life and, the, you know, microplastics. Yeah. You know, clean water, water sources. It's so, so important. So... Uncharted Waters really takes you on a metaphorical journey through different bodies of water and what we can learn from mm. a lake about mm. stillness, silence, reflection. A puddle is playfulness, a mm. waterfall is courage, an ocean of emotions. Um, so really the book is um, a call for people to fall in love with water again, to realize that no water, mm. no life. No life. Yeah. And uh, you've been on so many different adventures in your life. But which one do you cherish the most? Which adventure has been the one that has been closest to your heart? Mm. Everybody needs to go to Nepal at least That's once in their lifetime. One, yeah. Because uh, the beauty of the mountains, the people, uh, the energy, the, 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 the landscape... So after 18 days of walking through the mountains to um, the start of Everest expeditions, you mm -hmm. know, to get to Everest Base Camp is 5,470 meters. Mm -hmm. So that's the starting that's place one. for people to go to yeah. 8,800. So walking through those mountains just makes you, again, become in tune with nature and you let go. It's almost as if you're letting go a lot of things. That I don't need to carry that anymore. That's not important anymore. And you see people in the villages, kids in the villages, I hardly have anything that are just so happy and they're smiling. Yeah. Namaste. Experiencing that and seeing, you know, uh, the the mother goddess of the universe, mm -hmm. you know, there's the tallest mountain in the world. And then kind of coming back from that trip, that's when I finally had the courage. So it was life altering mm -hmm. to leave the security of my full-time job and start Mountain High. So yeah. that was definitely one of the, the kind of outstanding experiences that really changed the trajectory of my career. That's incredible. Also, you say that, um, you know, when you travel, is also it's all about learning new cultures and learning mm. new experiences. But for you, which is that one culture that you have been awestruck by? Mm. I think it would have to be very close between Bhutan and Tibet with a tendency mm. towards Bhutan because I was always intrigued by um, a country that had gross national happiness <laughs> instead yeah. of GDP. Yeah, yeah. You know, the fourth king in 1974, people GNH, thought, what, yeah, what, yeah. What, GNH, what is he talking yeah. about? Um, so I took a group, uh, we were 18, actually 17 women and one man that came with his wife to Bhutan in 2017. Mm. And the challenge of the trip name was called Jewels of Bhutan because I really wanted to experience the very special thing. So we hiked to Tiger's Nest. Mm. We did the Dragon's mm. uh, Path. We went to the, the festivals. And I think that whole, you know, there was so much intrigue about Bhutan because it's not so easy to get there. Mm. And I think it's just this incredible culture that it's like time has stood still. Yeah. And the spiritual depth and the landscape and the architecture and their love of nature, mm. that nature is a source of happiness. And the chanting, you know, when you're approaching Tiger's Nest and you can hear hundreds of monks just chanting yeah. in that it's vibration. And it's just incredible and an overload, really. Mm. And mm. we had such a beautiful time there. Mm. 
And I've always felt that's kind of stayed with me, you know, being in the monasteries, experiencing that landscape. Mm. We planted juniper trees there as well. Ah. Um, so that was the kind of regenerative side. Yeah. So that kind of culture um, I found very intriguing. And I thought, how can culture. you bring that? And then obviously years later, you know, yeah. we have um, Gross National Happiness. Mm -hmm. You have the Happiness Index. Yeah. It's a, a UN yeah. um, initiative, yeah. you know, and we all talk, we have a Happiness Street here. So it's kind of had yeah. um, uh They have SDF when you just land. They have a sustainable development fee yes. when you land. Yeah. Uh, I have. I just came back from Bhutan. Oh, okay. So whatever you're saying, it's like I'm resonating. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. yes. And yes. I just, you know, hiked up the tiger's nest. And again, for me, that was life altering in a way. I've ne I'm not a hiker. I've never mm. hiked before. And this was my first time. And I hiked with my son. Oh, and it was a very, very um, intense moment, you mm. know, for me. Because when I started, I didn't start with... I'm like, okay, I'm just going to go. And I've never done this before. I don't know if this is me. And mm. I started, I'm like, shit, I don't know if I can do this, you yes. know. <laughs> and then, then you know, I, I kind of slowed down. And then I was, then, then I kind of got into the groove of it. And the guide told me what to do. And then I kind of paced it. We did it. And I, you know, and I'm like, wow, I did that. And mm. again, it was a calling. Yeah. You know, it's something I wanted to do, something yeah. I've never done before. Yeah. Uh, but Bhutan, like you say, it's it's a different world altogether. Mm. Very much you so. You know, they live very differently. Their ideologies are very different. This respect mm. that they have for nature. And they're so humble. Beautifully humble. So the Bhutanese culture yeah. is something that you were completely fascinated yes. by. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, of course, um, you see so much when you travel around the world. You go through so many different experiences. But has there been an experience in your life that has kind of shaken you, you know, perhaps the time when you had to flee from Kuwait or any other experience, you know, in, in your travel life as yes. well? Yeah, yeah. Talk to us about that. I think definitely you just really hit the nail on the head with the Kuwait experience. Mm -hmm. Because when I was 20, uh, 27, I went to work in Kuwait. Mm -hmm. I was the first female recreation manager at the Holiday Inn Crown Plaza in Kuwait. Mm. Unfortunately, I was there when Iraq invaded back in 1990. I was wow. there. And all of a sudden, I had a call. To, I was living in the hotel to say crisis management meeting. We've been, you know, Iraq's taken over. It was huge, you know, and I couldn't call anybody. All the international lines were down. So all of a sudden, you find yourself in this environment in in um, a war zone basically mm. and thinking what what do i do mm. um so i mean three weeks later i, I was given the opportunity to make a crossing uh, across the desert into Saudi uh, with a group of people. So and you were there in Kuwait chance. for three weeks until then? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Amidst um, the war. Thankfully, our hotel wasn't too much impacted, but making that decision to leave in the middle of the night in a convoy um, across the desert and then being stopped um, and held um, wow. at gunpoint. And at then gunpoint. finding a way out of that through conversation, through, um, you know, a peace offering of uh, food and, and water kind of thing, and then man managing to make it to the border and then eventually to the British embassy. So that was the kind of, the real kind of first um, adventure, but mm. one that was very... Um, that shook you. Shook me, yeah. yeah. Would you go back to Kuwait today? So mm. I actually did go back to work in Kuwait from 1994. So I That's left wonderful. in 1990. I went 94 to 97, mm. and then I moved across uh, to Dubai. But that's that's wonderful. I mean, that experience that you went through <laughs> at the time during the war did not deter you from no. going back to that place. And that no. says a lot about, you know, you as, as so evolved because you understood what that was at the time, mm. but it wasn't the place. So, no, you know, definitely. But, but that's group. That's really amazing. But also now, um, tell me. You've been around so many places in the world, but there must be something, there must be some hidden gem that, you know, you would like to share with us today. You know, the first time I went to the Arctic, the top of the earth, mm -hmm. you know, was in 2007. And because I had a beautiful uh, Norwegian friend, Janneke, mm -hmm. and um, because she's originally Norwegian, she said, you know, there's a beautiful place called Svalbard or Longyearbyen, and there's thousands of polar bears, thousands of reindeers, seals, and about 1,800 people that live there. And you can go dog sledding, ice caving, these kind of things. 
And so we went in 2007 and we flew into Oslo and then flew into uh, Svalbard. And I remember there's only about 50 kilometers of road and then the rest is snow. We came into this like explorer's world that mm. we were in this whole new world basically where um warm clothes arctic boots you know connection to the dogs that that's the only way that you could travel and yeah. it was 24 hours daylight so you had to pull down these dark blinds because you'd still think it's yeah. you know seven eight o'clock and yeah. it's actually two o'clock in the morning yeah but it was just this beauty of this rugged um earthiness of the place but then having beautiful meals you know it, it seemed like you'd expect you know, to have kind of expedition yeah. stir meals yeah, or something, yeah. but it was just beautiful and and being in that place and then staying uh, at the the um, the dog yard in a trapper's hut, like a gamme, and we were all uh, in a circle and sleeping bag, sleeping on reindeer skins, just with mm. a fire in the middle. And people think, oh gosh, that must have been awful, but it was very very exciting. You you felt like a so would a you real say... adventurer and explorer. Oh, okay. yes. So would you say Svalbard is like a hidden gem in a way? I think it is, yeah. you know, it's um, it's it's quite expensive to, mm. to go there because mm. obviously they get supplies from the mainland mm. and it's mm. seasonal and it's not everybody's idea of a vacation. Right. You know, yeah. um, you know, there's a museum there. There's the um, there's some beautiful artwork there. Again, it's what you call to. Yeah. You know, some people say I want to go and learn how to cook. Thai food in Thailand and mm. meditate with monks. That's my idea of bliss. Mm. Other people say, no, I want to be really cold and I want to be out on a boat and I want to go yeah. ice fishing, ice diving, all yeah. of these things. But to so you, Svalbard well, really me, came out I, as a gem. Yeah, yeah. I have been 10 times. Yeah. So that wow. says a lot because okay. most places I've been to but two I was just, or my three next times. question was going to be uh, <laughs> 10 times. Okay, yes. 10 times in Svalbard. But is that also your favorite destination? It was very much, I felt at home there, you know, it's very rare I would go somewhere 10 times, um, really. And so I've definitely had my fix as well, but wow. would I go back again in a heartbeat? Wow. Uh, and I know that there's so many other beautiful places on the planet. I have so. been wanting to go to Svalbard for the longest time and I know mm. who to yes. ask for all the tips. <laughs> Where to go, I... what to do, when to go. Yeah, yes. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, Julie, we spoke about so much about different parts of the world, your favorite destination, hidden gem. But, you know, I know that, you know, nature and the world at large is so important to you and mm. the elements of nature yeah. are so important to you. So what what would you say that we need to do for responsible travel? Mm. It's that kind of leave no trace, mm. isn't it? Only mm. footprints. And yeah. for myself Because we now, talk about it, we but do, do we do, do enough? Do we do it? Yes, yeah. yeah. And I think it's there is a lot more... Um, conscious mm -hmm. travel about mm -hmm. you know how we get there what services we use are we um supporting the local community yeah. instead of going with big chains yeah. you know are we uh, giving back into the community yeah. buying local products buying um uh, arts and crafts and souvenirs that are actually made there mm. not imported in from mm. anywhere else yeah. Yeah. um checking with um hotels guest houses what are your sustainable practices mm. are you a throwaway yeah. kind of organization mm. or are you you know glass uh, bottles for water, mm. um, washing the towels. I mean, I think it's just important. This is this regenerative, eco-sustainable tourism mm. to make sure that it's not just greenwashing, that, mm. you know, that yes, we do. Mm. We do what we say we're going to mm. do. And we're very conscious, mm. uh, making sure that um, we're very aware, um, you know, even something as simple as asking people if you mind to have their p picture taken, mm. because that to me is responsible tourism, not mm. just taking pictures of everything when it's maybe not appropriate, yeah. um, you know, picking up litter, you know, helping the community. So mm. there's so many different things, you know, mm. the products, the services. Do you know they do, are they do, are they being conscious and responsible? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I I don't want to work with them. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> no, I'm no. with you, and that is why. I mean, I thought this question was so important because uh, we don't do enough and say enough mm. and talk enough, and there is there are, the conversations are happening in today's world, but it's not enough. It's up to everybody to do what they want to do, but I think it's important that we do something, something little, something small in our own way. Definitely. You if know? we want to keep traveling to if these we places. Wanna, yeah, if we want the world <laughs> yes. to exist. Yes, you know, there's there... no planet B, as yeah. everybody keeps saying. <laughs> no, there's no plan B. <laughs> so, you know, coming back more about uh, travel in the world, which is that one place that you would highly recommend that people should go in 2024? Many years ago, uh, I took a small group of clients to Japan. Mm -hmm. 
And again, I go go yeah, see because, yeah. I, you know, I can literally, when I say the country, I go right back to that place. And I, Kyoto, mm. it was just beautiful. Mm. And uh, cherry blossoms, mm. the Zen gardens, the geisha, the culture, the food, the Japanese um, philosophy, mm. you know, so beautiful. And it just all seemed to be yeah, there yeah. You know, in that landscape. Yeah. And so there's this intrigue about Japan and about uh, Japanese philosophy mm. and uh, food and culture because you've got Tokyo mm. uh, and but then you've got Kyoto mm. and you've got Mount Fuji mm. and then you've got these beautiful lakes mm. so it's a it's definitely a place of contrast but mm. I found Kyoto was um, a beautiful beautiful mm. experience mm. you know to be having the uh, matcha tea with the geisha and mm. and how spiritual experience how important that process that ceremony was you and have then, to be lucky to be able to do that because yes. you know even even spotting a geisha in today's yes. world is yes it's considered to be lucky if yes. you, you know we were very lucky yeah. we had very good guides i always say japan has a soul mm. You yes. know, it has a soul yeah. because the people are so nice. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, yeah, you they're, know, they're, so... they're so nice. So, yeah, it's a, Japan is definitely a country I think everyone should visit. Mm. But what is next on your bucket list? What are you looking forward to next in travel? Yeah, the book mm. uh, has really opened up a whole new world to me mm. because looking at water all around the world, whether it's oceans, lakes, rivers, waterfalls, streams, etc. Mm. So I'm really now looking at places that will offer the opportunity to be in, on, around mm. or maybe underwater mm. um, and connecting with whales and dolphins, marine life. So wow. um, I'm looking at places like the Azores. Mm. I'm looking at sailing trips, mm. coastal walks. Mm. Yeah, just looking at different places now. So lots of ideas that are brewing. Well, that's wonderful. And I hope you keep flowing. Yes. Like your book. Like and water. I hope the book does very well. And uh, I hope you get to go to all these amazing places. Um, and you get to swim and flow along with the book in the waters yes. that you want to <laughs> in different shores and, yes. you know, places. But this was so nice. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you. Uh, really, really appreciate this entire conversation. And uh, yeah, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. I hope our conversations have fueled your imagination and inspired you to explore the world in new and exciting ways. Please don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. And until the next time, keep traveling and stay safe.